Uh, good day, guys. Uh, my name is Liam. I'm going to see if that's how it works. Cool. So I am the founder of Eat Your Water. Um, basically, to give you a bit of a background about myself, just quickly, uh, I'm 22 years old. I am studying over at New Space, doing a Bachelor of Business, Bachelor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which I'm almost done, but sort of not at the same time. So probably be there for another year and a bit. Um, yeah, I started at Your Water four years ago when I was 18. Um, and a lot has come out of it. And probably my biggest achievement to date was in February, I was invited down to Melbourne uh, for Australia Retail Week, where I was lucky enough to be named one of the top 50 people in e-commerce in Australia for 2019. Um, I was the youngest on the list that year and I'm the second youngest ever in like the six or seven years that that's been going. Um, I, when I told my friends and family, cause I found out uh, quite beforehand that that happened, I didn't think, I don't think they really comprehended how big of an achievement that was until they realized the other names on the list. And just to run some off, there was people from Qantas, Coles, T2, Cotton On, The Iconic, uh, Shopo, Flora and Fauna, so all these big guns. And then there's this little skinny dude <laughs> hanging out with uh, like all these people who I've always idolized in the, indus in the industry. So it was, it was pretty sick and that was an eye-opening thing for me um, where I learned a lot and it changed my views on business. And I guess today what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of run through my journey and uh, what I've started to learn from my business, why I got into it, things like that. And then I'm going to run into sort of how I actually went about building like the product, the brand and the team and essentially and how I've managed to tie that all in together to actually get a business that can sustain myself and, you know, make an impact in the wider community. So hopefully you get something out of it, uh, if anything. So basically, uh, I'm starting off with a sick pun that I came up with. It's <laughs> eat your what -er, because whenever someone asks me, what's your business? And I go eat your water, they go eat your what? Um, because... So I don't know if it was like the best branding choice ever or not, but it seems to be paying off in the long run. Um, in terms of what Eat Your Water is, if you're not familiar with it, it's an Aussie surf brand and we've got an emphasis on basically environmental conservation, so marine conservation uh, in particular. So uh, we sell pre pretty much only online. We've done a couple of runs in, a, in small uh, independent stores around Australia, but in my opinion, it's never something that I've, been totally interested. I figure there's so much power online and that's the way I see it all going. So that's where I put most of my focus. Um, it's got tens of thousands of followers worldwide. We're shipping internationally with the US, Australia and New Zealand being our biggest markets. Uh, but Australia still takes up about, I'd say 80, 85% of that. But I think in the next year, I'm going to start looking a bit more to push into the US because Basically, to be able to, like, because we're Australia and we're so far away from literally everything, shipping costs and when you've got Australia Post as and DHL in a way and TNT, they're sort of determining the prices, and it's so hard to compete when you when you can't like, like when you can't actually afford almost to go into those uh, countries because the shipping prices are crazy. Um, as for why I started Eat Your Water, um, I think it, I, I, it sort of helps to go back to like my high school life because uh, in high school, I think I was a naturally smart kid, like not to be too boasting, but my parents brought me up and I was always watching like ABC and nothing else, um, which was good and bad. Like I always wanted to watch The Simpsons, but it was never allowed. Um, so yeah, I was brought up like that. And I think when I hit year 10, that's when I realized like the natural smarts wasn't enough to cut it. So going into year 11, we all had to write down what ATAR we wanted um, basically at the end of year 12. And I wrote 90. Um, <laughs> that, that didn't quite happen. I ended up getting 65. <laughs> um, so I was a bit far off, but in my main goal for high school was to basically get uh, a particular award at my year 12 formal, which was class clown, and I happened to get that. So that was, that was better than any ATAR you could possibly get. Um, but yeah, so obviously getting an ATAR of 64, 65, I think it was like 64.5, um, didn't leave me with many options uh, for university, uh, sort of like what arts, business, uh, and then envi environmental science and management was the first degree I decided to do. Um, because, and majoring in marine biology because I thought like you'd swim with sharks and swim with dolphins. It turns out I'm actually like get really badly boat sick as well so, or seasick. So that didn't play out too well. But 
that was down at Arimba and I'm from Maitland, so driving an hour uh, to university and an hour home really wasn't all that fun. Um, so, and I remember my very first lecture, which was down there, I had it for two hours and driving home, I pulled over and I called my mum and I said, this literally isn't for me. Um, she said, stick it out, probably while having like a huge panic attack that I was going to drop out and, you know, do, <laughs> do something bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, of course I stuck it out. I ended up doing marine biology for a year, but it was week three of that first semester where I was sitting at uni outside Pinky's at Callahan, which is a little convenience store. I'm not sure if it's still there. And I, I remember, and I was, and I asked myself, what do I really want to do with my life? And I sort of thought I didn't want to work or do anything. <laughs> Just wanted that, like literally that life of traveling. And I figured what's the best way to do that. And I thought you'd have to own a business and, um, so yeah, I pretty much opened up an Instagram account and started trying to get people to follow this idea that I had that wasn't really even an idea. Um, but yeah, so that's where Eat Your Water all started and that's pretty much why I started it. I just was hating my university degree at the time and I wanted more from life. I didn't want to do like that nine to five job and I, I doing, doing what I do now, I would never want to go to a nine to five job again. I just think it's a terrible way of living. So yeah. Uh, in terms of my business, there's always good bits. Obviously, being self-employed is awesome, um, and but there's so many crap bits. And obviously, being um, yeah, being a business owner, I'm not exempt to the crap bits. The good bits are pretty obvious, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. So you know, like selling to people worldwide, uh, having people like you guys come and listen to me, uh, having pe like seeing people wear stuff at festivals, all that sort of jazz. Like all the good stuff is pretty self-explanatory but the crap bits is what uh i think is the side of business that i didn't know like it's something that i didn't know i was getting into when it came to came to starting it so basically probably personally for me um with the business i found i found when it sort of got from that stage of being a hobby to something that i could feel like that i thought you know this could actually be something that that carries me through life um I, I felt a lot of stress because I was working part-time three to four days a week. I was at university and I was doing this uh, in every other moment that I could. And that stress was like crazy. Like it was literally, I would sit there frozen at times and because I'd just be overwhelmed with all the stuff that I had to do. Um, but yeah, I think the important thing when you realize things like that, that are affecting you personally when you're in business and sometimes it's, I've, I've found it difficult to acknowledge that that was happening because your life seems like pretty good, but at the same time, it might not be. So for me, the way I combat that now is I literally have a diary and I just write my to-do list every single day. Um, basically what I've got to do, cross it off when it's done, add something on if there's something new to do. So I find that helps with that. And, and then for other crap bits, like being a business owner and being young, I literally had no idea what I was doing. I, like throughout year 11 and 12, uh, I was trying to do science, like science back to courses like physics, chemistry, which I ended up all dropping all those anyway. But um, so I had no experience with when it came to business. So I was bound to make mistakes like any business owner. Um, but yeah, so I think the thing that makes, that makes an entrepreneur have that capability to be, have that ability to be successful down the run is the way they basically deal with the stuff ups. Um, so like for instance, probably the best example that I have, it's probably been my biggest stuff up and it only happened a year and a bit ago maybe. Um, basically one of my main suppliers went under uh, who happened to do about 80% of my stock. So obviously that's a pretty big uh, deal when it comes to business. So what I did is I basically have like this, this directory where I've basically stored all these possible, uh, you know, plan B suppliers and I pulled just one out and I'm like, that'll do. And I, just ordered a bunch of stock and you can probably already tell like that's a pretty dumb move. Um, but yeah, so basically 10, eight weeks later, this stock came in and I looked at it and in, I reckon the space of one second, I straight away knew I would not sell any of it because I didn't like it. It wasn't going to be good for the brand image or anything like that. And that was about $35,000 that I just, I, I literally accepted as a sunk cost within one second of it basically arriving. Um, and what I did, I, like I told my family and they were sort of like, well, you've got to sell some of it or you, why don't you just sell it? It's not that bad and all that. But to me, I was adamant that it would stuff up like the brand image and everything. 
And that's sort of the main thing that I think you've got to have as a trait, as an entrepreneur. So when these bad things happen, you've got to acknowledge that they're there and you've got to learn that they've happened, but you can't dwell on it. You've literally got to move forward. And like, if I stopped and just gave up at any stuff up I had, I wouldn't have even got like the first batch of t-shirts ever in because yeah, there was so much going wrong at the start as well. But, um, but yeah, that's literally to me the most important thing when it comes to, comes to a trait. It's just knowing when a mistake happens, not to dwell on it, to keep moving forward. There's always ways out. You can literally lose half your business. And I just think like, oh, well, you know, so that's just my way of dealing with it. Um, and I think, it, yeah, it is, it is the best way of doing it. I know it's a hard thing to do, but yeah, I don't know why it's happened to me and that's how I am, but no, it, it works out. So now I'm just going to run over building the brand, building the product and building the team. Um, so the brand, obviously I didn't really know I was building a brand essentially like when you throw in all the terms at the start as I was 18 years old um, and no business experience, but basically the way I thought about it and the way I did it was I looked at who my competitors were indirect, direct, anyone who was in the scene, um, who were big, not, not your little mum and dad businesses like me. I didn't even consider them, but I looked at the big ones. So for me, it was like offends, the critical slide society, uh, surf to achieve. And so like anyone like that. And I looked at what they were doing and I was, uh, and basically I just said to myself, I've got to do what they're doing, but do it better. Um, and to me, when you think startup, I feel like so many people think straight away, oh, it's a new to the world idea that you're, um, that you're bringing in, you've got, you know, limited competitors. Uh, you got to, yeah, like you've got to have this new to the world idea, but like 99% of new businesses are going to be something that's already existing. So to me, the best way to do it is to look at who your competitors are and do what they're doing and do it better. Cause what you've got to really do in doing that is give customers who are potentially buying from them a reason to buy from you. And if you look like a mum and dad business, you're not going to have much trust with customers naturally. Um, so I, on, on like a, on a big scale, so you obviously have trust from your friends and family, but in reality, if you're just selling to friends and family, you're not really going to get that far. Um, so yeah, that was pretty much building the brand for me. It was something that I wanted to do extremely quickly. I wanted to basically get as many followers as I could. It took me about three goes over, I think about probably an eight month period before I actually settled on a logo that I was happy with and, uh, typography and stuff like that. So I also like, that's another thing I could probably stress is don't be afraid to train, change your branding if it's not working. Um, but yeah, I feel like definitely that I, the main thing I was trying to do was just grow as quickly as I can. So I could basically imitate and make it look like I was this huge sort of business, uh, despite being like this dude who was just running it out of his bedroom, you know? So yeah, so that's pretty much what I did. And I feel like I did it quite well. Um, and so then when it came to the product, uh, to me, the product is almost the most important thing of a business and that might be wrong. I don't know, Gary's looking at me, so who knows, but to me, the product is the most important because if you, if your product or service, whatever you're selling, if it's crap, no one's going to buy it and thus you don't have a business. So the, the most common issue that I see when a fashion brand shows up or clothing brand, whatever, especially on Instagram is I look at what they're selling and let's say let's say they get like a, one design and they get it in white and black. So basically you're sending this one design to, to all your followers and either they like it or they don't. And that's the only information you really get from them. So the way I did it differently, and this has basically led to like the, the fast growth of eat your water and the ability to, to, to basically have like that goes hand in hand with that brand and looking bigger than what you are. So what, what I did, so I did that sort of strategy for like eight months and I realized it's so slow and it's not going anywhere. So it got to a point where I was just like, okay, let's just get six, seven designs in totally different and just do the lowest quantity that I possibly could. So I think I was getting like 20 to 30 of these like six individual designs. Um, and that basically, there's a lot of benefits that I found to doing that. So the first one is if something didn't sell, so if it was essentially a flop, you're not losing that much money. But the main thing that I noticed is you'll figure out designs that like designs and concepts that are working in your product by doing these variations. And basically when you realize what 
like when you see that one design selling more than the other, you can basically sit there and question why is that design or why is that product selling more than this other product? And to me, that leads you like a path that you can go down and you start focusing and doubling down on those products that are actually working and start not bothering with uh, ones that aren't. And to me, that's been one of the keys behind uh, Eat Your Water success is basically realizing quickly what products work, what products don't. So like for me personally, corduroy caps are a huge seller. Like I can literally put anything on corduroy and it will sell. So there's a hot tip for you. Um, but yeah, that, that's like, but that's all through testing. So like just getting as many products as you can in low quantities and just giving them out to everyone, running some ads on things and just seeing what works and then doubling down on that. And look, you might not be making a huge profit at the start, but if you're, in, if you're running your business in the sole reason to take money out of it, it's probably not, I don't know, but to me, it's not the right reason to be in business. I don't think I drew a wage from it, your water for about two and a half, three years and it didn't bother me. So, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the product in my sense. And I think I'm lucky because I do a lot of the graphic designs for it, probably about 80, 90%. And I'm a terrible artist in reality. Like if you ask me to freehand draw anything, it'll look like crap. Uh, I think I've got a C in like year eight art. But uh, basically the, I, I ended up buying an iPad Pro and a pen and it makes it so much easier you just rub out what you're not doing. But the fact that I'm an average artist is good because I don't have one particular style. So I can basically do a number of different styles um, and it sort of benefits Eat Your Water. So I can make it all adhere to the brand, but at the same time, they're all individual. And then you sort of like, like with that, uh, what I said previously, you just go down that path that's working more. And, uh, and yeah, so that sort of helps that. Uh, in terms of building the team, to me, the team is anyone who's helping me in the back end of the business um, and not so much, uh, and, and not like, yeah, it's right. It, like the team to me is anyone in the back end of the business. So it could be like accountants, it could be manufacturers, could be photographers, graphic designers, anything like that. And the best thing about teams these days is we don't all need to be in the same room. Like basically apart from one mate who's going to be packing orders when I go on holidays later this year, I'm the only person in Newcastle from Eat Your Water. There's, I've got a graphic designer in Germany, one in the UK, one in Indonesia. Uh, my main photographer, Lewis, who does a lot of the content on Instagram, he's in Perth and I've never met him despite knowing him for like two and a half years. Um, Judah is from Coffs, who's been, he's the only one who's been with me really from the start uh, in terms of helping out as a photographer slash model. Um, but yeah, so I think it's an exciting time where you can develop these teams uh, in terms of not having to basically look in your immediate surroundings. And the way I went about developing my team is I didn't look at the things that I didn't want to do. I looked at the things that I was naturally shit at. Um, so basically for me, I recognized quickly if I want to imitate these other brands, um, despite me and my brother thinking we look like stallions, um, we're, we're, we're not. So basically... And, and <laughs> um, yeah, so basically we, we identify quickly that we're, we're not the good, the best models and we're not really that good at photography. So that was the first thing that I basically outsourced besides obviously making t-shirts because like year eight textiles didn't quite stand up. But, um, but yeah, so basically I looked at what I wasn't, wasn't good at. And sometimes I think that can be a difficult thing to face because it could be the one thing that you actually enjoy in a business. So whether it be designing and stuff, but I think everyone knows deep down if they're good at it, like, or not. And so I think in business, it comes to that point where you've got to identify, but you've got to be real with yourself and say, what am I actually not good at? What am I actually good at? And so despite I, the fact I didn't want to do the accounting for the work, there wasn't really enough resources to throw like a full team of accountants on there. Whereas now I'm happy because I'm paying a great accountant in Newcastle heaps of money, but they do an awesome job and I don't even have to think about accounting anymore. But yeah, I think what you've got to do is you've got to weigh up what, and what, this is what I did. I just weighed up what, um, what things I wasn't good at, what things, uh, and then once I sort of figured out what I wasn't good at, so I wasn't good at accounting, I wasn't good at photography, but then I figured what are my customers seeing more of? My customers aren't going to be seeing my accounting. They're going to be seeing like the content on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, so that was sort of priority for me. So in my, in my mind, I basically had this idea of 
what's going to be what's going to come out like what's going to be the first thing i outsource and what's going to be like the last thing um so because I, I still pack orders to this day which is literally the most boring job and i hate doing that for three hours every every day but you know well not every day but most days um so so yeah and the other important thing when it came to basically building a team was there's a lot of a lot of shit people in terms of like like their quality like i know what my brand and what my product is and i found straight away if someone doesn't basically understand that and know how to deliver on that i would i would cut them out straight away no matter what the what the deal was so basically i just think you should never be afraid to just if someone's not benefiting your business literally just cut them out and that's what i've managed to do and that's what i still do um so basically social media social media is the backbone of my business um it's enabled people like me uh to be nothing four years ago and be something now through basically you know something out of your bedroom um and the reason why i spoke about branding uh product and team is because to me they contribute heavily to social media and social media is uh sort of links back like they're all interconnected and to me that's how you can create a successful business once you get those three on point um so basically any business that isn't using social media to me is crazy um it is such a cheap form of advertising and to give you an idea for about every four thousand dollars that we're spending on advertising um which i'd say 90 percent would be on facebook instagram ads um, we're getting about a hundred thousand dollars in return. So it's literally four grand out a hundred K in. And like, if you think about how good that is as an investment, like it's pretty good. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much like with social media, but the reason why branding product and, um, team is so important is so if you know anything about Facebook advertising, you can boost posts or you can go into this back end thing where you actually create the ads properly and so you can create ads um through this back end way which is the way you should be doing it and it's the way i do it if you are running a business essentially um and like at the moment our cost per purchase through facebook advertising so how much we when we're actually going for when the objective is a conversion the cost we're getting per purchase is 30 cents so i give facebook 30 cents and someone buys from my website um, and like the industry average for fashion for for the fashion industry is normally eight to twelve dollars and the reason why you can get it so low to 30 cents is it comes back to the branding to the product and the team so to me the team uh is someone who can take the product and fit it in with the brand so on social media i see a lot of businesses who just focus on their product and they're trying to sell constantly um, in that sort of aspect um, and I feel like it can work at times, but it's something you've got to sort of refrain from. Um, so basically if you get an, this is how I perceive it all in a social media sense. So your product will be the guy wearing the T but is the t-shirt on the guy. The brand is literally everything else around it. So, you know, a sunny sky, a long haired blonde dude, um, you know, ocean, all that sort of stuff. And so what you need to do is basically make it so that it actually you know so that it all it all works nicely and when you get that 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 right point so when you get your brand your product and your um team all on point that's when you can start getting 30 cent purchases in my eyes because often i i get asked oh, so what are you doing on social media and social media like that 30 cent per purchase is the main reason i got that uh the the accolade in the e-commerce top 50 thing um and Basically, people ask me, so how do you get that, get it that low? And I'll tell them how I'm doing it. Like it's no, it's no secret and it's obvious. There's no secret to Facebook advertising. It's literally what your business is like that's going to make it work or not. Um, so, so yeah, I get asked that a lot and I look at what they're doing and they're doing the exact same thing as me. And then the issue that they've got to basically face is that it's either their brand, their product or their team that's letting them down or a combination. And that can obviously be a difficult thing to sort of realize because you could have invested so much time and now you're getting told that your brand <coughs> shit or your product is no good or you know your team isn't capturing your product right for your brand um so yeah that's a that's sort of like the 
that's that's the thing of social media for me so that's how to me it's all interconnected in terms of brand product and team when it comes to social media and that's how you get to drive those results all right the uh the future uh, so this was a suggested point when i got told to speak and i thought it was pretty cool because when i went down to melbourne uh, i was talking like it was basically a bunch of people sort of peacocking and you're like like we all love each other but at the same time we all despise each other because we want to be each other um but it, it was really cool like i spoke to these guys from the uh the red cross uh yeah, red, no salvos salvos that makes more sense salvation army um and they're doing this cool thing called moving the needle which is all about basically the war on fast fashion which is a huge issue um globally uh when it comes to the fashion industry and basically that's doing this take back scheme thing uh that i've sort of I, i'm looking into at the moment but it isn't the first thing on my mind when it comes to the business the way i see the fashion industry going is it's all about sustainability and while a lot of my designs are really focused on conservation and stuff like that in terms of actual business practice i've never really put it at the forefront but at the moment like after this year and after everything there it's i feel like it's really time to start pushing that so uh after coming back i thought about it for a while and then i literally emailed all my suppliers and i was like any plastic we're going to cut that out and so obviously you need to start finding alternatives and at the moment uh with my main supplier for t-shirts jumpers all that sort of jazz um we're working on a packaging that uh, is made from basically a, a root vegetable vegetable um and the idea of it is you get your package, you take the t-shirt out, it's in another package. And traditionally that would just be plastic and plastic and people do what they do. Um, but the idea is you get those two and you just pop them in water and it's gone. So all you're left with is a t-shirt at the end. And I don't know any clothing brand at the moment, especially in the surf industry, that's truly doing something like that. I know there's a lot on compost, compost bags and stuff like that um but yeah so eat water is now sort of grown to this point where i'm able to invest this money and and sort of do things like that which is always cool um but yeah because that's the way it's inevitably going and the idea of me doing that is when obviously that's going to cost me more because the it, there's not as much demand on that sort of packaging than just traditional pl plastic and plastics cheap and all that sort of jazz so it's going to cost me more and often businesses will charge a premium when you're doing things like that so like whether you're getting hemp t-shirts it's like oh it's premium um so you'll be paying a lot more so my sort of thinking around it so you can sort of get a glimpse into my mind is that um basically it's going to cost me more now and my profit margin is going to go a little bit down like a dollar but when you're making i think at the moment the underlying profit margin on t-shirts about 24 dollars anyway so down to 23 dollars um the idea of it is not charge a premium and basically be known as those guys who are actually doing good genuinely um and and then when because there's going to it's going to come a time where there's such demand for it where if you're not doing it you literally there's, there's no sort of point uh there's like if you're not doing it like in in three years say let's say it's it's just common knowledge that you're using basically compostable bags plastic bioplastic all that jazz um and that if you're not doing it so the demand will naturally increase price will come down and then i sort of see it as uh then you open it back up you've grant, gained all these customers from just being the good guys without charging a premium and stuff like that um so yeah that's sort of like that's sort of an insight into i guess eat your water and my way of thinking um i've never been one for business plans i think i've always just sort of like <laughs> looked forward and thought about what i'm what i'm doing and and what needs to be done in a business to keep it keep it happening and people always ask well if you're relying on social media so much what happens if it all goes down one i don't think it will two if it does there's going to be something else that literally rises up and you just jump on that it's like any form of advertising they always change um and it's just all about learning uh so yeah that's pretty much that i am always on these social media platforms so you can add me whatever ask me questions there like in the future if you're ever doing something and you're like what's the go um how can i do this whatever i'm all i'm pretty much open for everything unless you ask me who my manufacturer is that i, I never give out um and anything else is down for down for whatever so yeah but if you've got questions i'm happy to answer 
literally anything except who's your manufacturer. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how did you come across, how did you meet these people that you, like, you have never met them in person, yeah. how did you discover? Yeah, no, that's a good question. How did they choose to deploy their like, how did they sort of so basically, like I said, a lot of it's testing. So as soon as someone's bad, I'll cut them. But the way, the only one I've actually ever met is Judah. Uh, and this is from having team members, like I've probably been through 40 odd people in, and there's probably 15 who I would still say are around now, uh, who I use now. Uh, probably actually more than 40 to be honest. But the way you meet them is through every, like through the way I do my business, social media. So they might message me, I'll message them. Um, a lot of the graphic designers, they might just follow me on Instagram and I happen to see them come up in my feed and I'll, I'll go check them out and I'll like what they're doing. So it's things like that, even like Pinterest or uh, I used to actually say, I used to do posts and say, we're looking for team members, uh, like photographers, put through your stuff, email us here and we'd get like hundreds of people and occasionally you get ones who are just like scooter riders doing kick flips and stuff and, or whatever you call it. He'll flip something like that. Um, but then you get the occasional diamond and that's how I met Lewis, uh, came across Lewis and yeah, he's great. And so Lewis is basically now, the way I've done a lot of it is so I don't, basically the only employee on the books at the moment is me and that's going to be someone and there's going to be another, but I use most of the team members as contractors. So a lot of like the photographers, for instance, are at first they're just getting free product, which is normally like $400 worth of free product and they're happy to do that anyway. But then like someone like Lewis, um, about two weeks ago, or a month ago, I'd say he went on a trip with three of his mates, a camping trip, which was all paid for. We paid for uh, basically him to go camping for the weekend and do, sh to shoot us a small clip and basically do some photography for us. So I sort of try to make it so that there's incentive for people to provide you know, good content and basically there's paths to go down and stuff like that. So yeah. That's not right. any other questions. Um, yeah. 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 Um, so I have done like a little bit on Facebook ads and stuff. Yeah. So do you run your Facebook ads or just run yeah, your I, I do all the marketing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so when you like first created an audience for your target or whatever, yeah. Did you run that all off previous purchases or did you no. have to wait your way to find who you're going to target? So most ads, um, I'll literally tell you who I target. <laughs> so, so basically I'm assuming you're talking about pixels and like basically getting, yeah. So I've, I've done that maybe three times and I'm looking at trying to, I'm going to set up a retargeting one because I've never really bothered with retargeting at the moment through a pixel, but I think the pixel it's good and it's beneficial, but in terms that's all that's doing is retargeting old customers and there's other ways to retain them. So I look at, um, I basically, what I will do is I just, do a conversion ad, I choose like conversions for instance, yeah. obvious one, uh, purchase, and then you start choosing your budget and all that jazz. And then for audience, uh, I go like Australia uh, and then I start looking at, so pretty much all, all my, I've got maybe 60 different audiences that I just rotate through who are all new and stuff like that. So let's say Splendor in the Grass lineup came out last week. As soon as it came out, I just went on Splendor 2018 audience name, went through the lineup, added them all, Triple J, Splendor, Groove in the Move, all that sort of jazz, have one for like surf brands, stuff like that. And, and yeah, that's, that's literally the way it works. And the benefit of that is you're always reaching a new audience. Whereas if you're just doing the pixel where you're retargeting old customers, they're probably already following you to start with. So the idea of a conversion where you're basically hitting like those new, like that, that audience is you're going to be finding new people all the time. And that's how Eat Water's following always grows. So you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. So it's a conversion ad that's getting conversions, but you're also getting followers. So say I spend like, a hundred dollars on a on an ad for caps or something uh generally you'll get like 200 250 purchases from that but you'll also get like 1000 new follow or 1000 a bit, bit up there but like 400 new followers on instagram maybe 100 uh new likes on uh on facebook stuff like that so and it's, it's also like, like I've, I've never really been one for just testing audiences and doing like your split tests because 
And I just feel like it's a waste of time. It's so easy to do it anyway. Um, but yeah, just play around with them. So like, you know, like brand awareness, I don't know if you've used that objective before, but I found it a point and it was really, really cool to do brand awareness. And I just really, literally did Australia, United States, New Zealand, did like just beach ocean and just did my best post that's been performing on Instagram that naturally performed well on Instagram. And I think from that, it got like 2000 new followers on Instagram for 80 bucks sort of thing. So which is, which is way better than obviously what some businesses do in the form of like buying followers and dumb shit like that. So uh, does that make sense? Anything else? Yeah. Like, any other well, questions? No, nah, yeah. nah, that's the dumbest right, thing right, any yeah. business can do, yeah. buy followers. Yeah. Any other cues? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said uh, the shipping is an expensive thing, which draws you back from shipping to yeah. the place you and you also hate doing it. Yeah. So why, uh, how come you haven't done like fulfillment uh, by Amazon or DHL or something? Uh, I've looked into it and I've had offers. I recently had an offer firm, an Alibaba group um, to do it. But I saw the one thing that I think, so Eat Your Water, we label ourselves as an independent surf brand. So we like that personal sort of touch. So the one thing that you commonly get is like in the comments of orders is people asking for free things, stickers, whatever. Um, and so like we do all these, like my, my thought of doing that is I can make it more personal doing it myself. So we'll throw in personal things like from cards to socks to air fresheners, things like that. Depending on the customer, we can see if there's like five orders, like it's definitely something I'd look into, but right now I, 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 I don't know. I just haven't, I haven't explored it enough because I'm sure I could say, well, for every fifth order, can you guys throw an extra thing? And, and they would, but. At the moment, I like that personal touch that I guess I can do at the moment. And it isn't it like packing orders. I don't enjoy it, but it isn't too overwhelming. And, you know, if, um, if it saves me a bit of money, because I'm huge on like just keeping as much money in a business that you can, because, you know, most, oh, well, not most, but a lot of businesses just fail because they run out of cash. So, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at. Any questions? initial investment? Like how much? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so often people think for a startup, you need a ton of money. All I ever invested was 1500 bucks and that's it. And so basically I was working as a checkout chick. I managed to save 1500 and I basically just put it all into the business. And that was way too much. Like you don't need to spend $1,500 to start up a clothing brand. If you're wondering, you can do it for like... 500 but i ended up paying for like my abn which is free and things like that <laughs> <laughs> so that's another mistake that 18 year old liam did um but yeah so yeah I, I i've never taken a loan out for the business i understand that there are businesses that need loans to and and investors to basically get it started but but yeah, I found that 1500 bucks was enough and then basically what i like i didn't take a cent out of it for two and a half three years so Basically, it was just like getting T-shirts in, selling them, reinvest that money, selling them and growing that like your cash pile that you have um, up to a point that you can literally get $35,000 worth of stock and just throw it in, like get rid of it. And you can do that like another seven times. Like, so that's sort of like where that's, that's how I've done it. And like investment would help in a way, but you know, you don't need that much. And, and, in reality, if you're, if you're at the start of a business and you're investing and, and let's say you get $10,000 and you just order a bunch of stock, you don't know that the stock's going to work. You probably don't have the followers to sell it. Um, so you really, I, I think starting from the ground, especially when it comes to fashion, it sort of gives you that, that idea. Like you start to learn in that early phase of what's going to work. Can I grow it on social media, stuff like that? Because, yeah, growing on social media has changed heaps from when I started. Like the algorithm's always changing and things like that. So. So yeah, but investment, I never, never looked at it and I probably never will because there's enough moolah there now to do what I want. <laughs> Any other cues? <laughs> yes, mate. <laughs> How many hours um, a day is like you spend all that time? <laughs> That's my brother and he always argues that I don't do enough around the house. Um, <laughs> so just to give you some context to that question. So... I don't know, like it's hard to say. So I'll run you through my general day. So I'd normally wake up at, an early day for me is like 9am. Uh, 
And so I purposely choose like uni to start. I think 11 is my earliest class this semester and ideally I would push that back an hour, but I can't. Um, so yeah, I'm normally up around early morning, then I'll check everything out, have, make sure everything's still there, like Instagram hasn't gone down, anything like that, have some lunch and then I'll pack orders in the afternoon and take them down. So that's probably like two, two hours, three hours on it then do whatever in the afternoon and then normally night is when I actually do most of the designing and stuff like that and, you know, setting up of ads. But there's like last week, I think I was up to about 3.30 a.m. a couple, one or two nights and, you know, like average bedtime at the moment is probably 1.30 a.m. So it's sort of like, I don't, know, I don't know how much time I spend on it, but it's probably not as much time as what people think you need to spend on it. So, yeah, good well, question. Study that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you've got... As long as you've got 24 hours, you've got time for an assessment, in my opinion. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any other cool questions? Are you still operating out of the bedroom? And your parents are getting a good return for their bedroom? No, so my parents moved to London for work for three years in October-ish. Um, so it all worked out pretty well, so I get like more. More <laughs> That's a straight lie. It's a straight lie. Um, yeah, so still doing it out of the bedroom and everything. And that's, that's sort of one of the cool things. Like on this outside, it looks like it's this huge business. And I'm sure people thought, oh, there must be like a warehouse and stuff. And I was just shelving and boxes all through the bedroom and things like that. Just sit on the floor, pack things in. And, yeah, and, I've, and, you know, like running an e-commerce business, it's sort of cool because you can do that fake sort of frontage. And I've always said like fake it so you make it in that sense. Um, but there's like bugger all overheads and like literally anything, any profit you make is like from a t-shirt. There's like, it's, it's pretty smooth sailing in that sense. So, no? You mentioned at the start that you were putting out designs, putting out products, doing the same thing over and over. And it wasn't until some point in time that you started doing uh, just knowing that it's not, not working pretty much. So, uh, like I said, uh, any mistake that I see happening, I just basically put it there, acknowledge that it's happening and, and move on. So to me, I realized that I wasn't selling enough to make me like what I, what I thought I needed to be selling. So I just started thinking of different ways to do it. And it, and it's not me sitting down at a table, writing out all these ideas to me. It's just, one thing I've always, like with my business is it's always just been uh, impulse for me. So like, which is why I did the stuff up and why a lot of things stuff up in the business. But, um, but yeah, I just started thinking, well, I need to look bigger than what I am. And, and that was the obvious choice for me. So a lot of it's just been, um, you know, what I think you should do in a business. Cause like I said, I had no, I had no experience in terms of business, so, but it all pays off now. Like, Yep. Um, <clears throat> I've read a few things about like e-commerce startups and that. They talk about building a, a brand or a following before even launching a product. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. think there's big value in doing yeah, that? Yeah, 100%. So to give you an idea, so uh, I was obsessed with building like my personal brand in high school, aka just being popular, <laughs> uh, which I've thrown out. I threw out the door as soon as I pretty much hit... <laughs> As soon as I hit high, uh, university and I just deleted that Instagram account and everything. But in terms of um, Eat Your Water, before I got any stock in, I think I had about 3,000 followers on Instagram and I got 30 t-shirts in. Um, and with those 30 t-shirts, I'm thinking, well, 3,000 followers, 30 t-shirts, these should be gone tonight. Uh, put them up. I was like, yep, online, uh, go buy them. Uh, nothing happened. And then I think after about three hours, I finally sold one. So it sort of shows you the importance of starting to build a brand because a lot of people think, yeah, 300 followers, that's a, that's a lot, but you need a lot more before you start, start being able to sell it. So I think there, there is a huge importance in getting a following and, you know, an engaged audience happening. And that's one of the biggest things I focus on with uh, Eat Your Water is keeping my followers engaged um, in a way that, you know, so they're seeing everything that I'm, that I'm doing. So like offends, I think have about a hundred thousand followers on Instagram and now I'm sitting at about 46, but in terms of like people commenting and liking my posts, I'm at, I'm about triple what they're averaging. And so it's through things like 
So when I noticed the Instagram algorithm changing and when they stopped doing it in like the chronological feed, I figured, well, I've got to do something to basically get it. So what I did is I made this competition called Thirsty 30, um, which sort of comes in with eat your water being like thirsty, pretty clever. Um, <laughs> and basically the idea was if, if you like the post within the first 30 minutes of it being posted, um, you're only with a chance of winning a gift card and it's just a $30 gift card. And so that would almost buy you something on the website. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a huge, like I lose basically no money from it, but it keeps engagement like crazy high. So that promotes with these, with the new algorithms. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically because in that 30 minutes, everyone has their post notifications on so they don't miss out, which is what we promote them, like basically encourage them to do. So in that first 30 minutes, we're getting about a thousand likes on a post ish. Um, and then there's comments coming through and stuff like that. So Instagram goes, wow, this is a well performing, um, post naturally. So then they start boosting it up the feed. And one other thing that I did uh, when it came to Instagram is when they basically came out and said, you can do fake, this is in terms of engagement. When they came out and said, do you want to make your Instagram account a business account? I, I haven't done that and I'm not going to. And, they're, really, and I, they're probably on to me now, but at the start, you, I, I, I straight away thought, why would they want you to be a business account? And in my, and, and this was after they removed the chronological feed. And in my eyes, it was because as soon as they know you're a business account, they're going to put your posts further down uh, so that you're getting less likes and then you're forced to boost your posts to essentially get more likes. So their idea to me was they're going to try drain how that, how, like the amount of likes so that you're willing to spend more. So it's things like that, just trying to stay ahead of, I guess, the algorithm. But yeah, definitely build an audience before you start investing too much in product. What do you do for, sorry, I won't take up too many questions. What do you do for content before you have any products though? I mean, I know you can, in some ways, you know, you can build a brand and aesthetic and that sort of thing, but yeah. did you find it hard <laughs> to keep people engaged when you don't actually... Uh, well, you can scroll down to the start of it. So, I, I don't think it took me too long to get to 3,000 followers just simply because of what I had on my personal account at the time before I got rid of that. But a lot of the posts, if you scroll down early on, there's, I think there's a couple of pictures of my feet. Uh, just post, oh, the other thing was posting like designs, which were all dodgily done with a finger on an iPad mini and be like, what one do you like? So it was just like, I didn't know I was product testing at the time, but you know, in reflection, that's what I was doing. So it was just sort of like, whatever you can post, post and um, make it work. But I, nowadays I'm a firm believer of if you do, if you're posting on uh, Instagram, if you don't have good content to post, don't post it. Uh, I see too often that businesses are literally just, trying to blast Instagram or Facebook and posting two to three times a day. Um, and eat your water might only post on Instagram once a week. And then I always get the argument, but, um, but your customers aren't going to see it. Like that's not enough advertising, but then you can just say, well, you're doing a Facebook ad in the background for seven days. But yeah, if you're just posting for the sake of posting, I feel like that can damage your brand. And you've got to remember social media at the fundamentals is basically for friends and family. Uh, you don't want to be blasted constantly by a business. And if you are blasting you, your customers all the time, you're going to start finding people are dropping off and not following you because you're annoying as anything. So, yeah. So did you start um, sort of putting the ecological message across early? Um, because there's that link between the surf and the yeah. ecology. Yeah. So not, not too much. Like my first design, I think was a, I'm pretty sure it was a, a beard, like a, a guy with a beard and it, and I called it the bearded dude t-shirt. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't something I did initially, but the thing that I picked up is that there was not, like my target market is young people who love like the ocean essentially. Um, so they're naturally inclined to, you know, um, care about the ocean. So it was sort of like trying to be the first into a market that, you know, like it's a, it's a niche within a niche, like surf brand, but then we're going conservation uh, environmental messages, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it took a bit of time to sort of get into that. But as soon as I realized that like who my audience was, so the first stages was figuring out sort of who my audience was going to be. And then when I, I identified that it was going to be surfers, um, that's when I started thinking, well, and, and it was through like product testing, like basically getting all these products out there and seeing what's selling. And then when you realize that, you know, you're more conser conservative sort of promoting 
good environmental messages are working, that's when I really started to double down on that part. Um, but yeah, at the start, it wasn't too much about it. Like honestly, at the start, I started Eat Your Water just to hopefully work for myself one day. Like, like there was no, like I'm not gonna say I'm an environmental warrior or anything, but yeah, I just wanted to make some money and not have to do anything with my life, so. <laughs> yeah. Alright, well on that one, we <laughs> 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 I'm sure Liam's willing